<laughs> well, Steve, firstly, yeah, welcome to GRDC in Conversations. It's great to have you here. We're chatting with different people involved in and around the grain sector. And I think your background and, and we were itself will be really interesting to, to talk about. And then also the whole crop capsules piece and, and what yourself and Anna are up to with your business as well. So welcome. Uh, thanks, Ollie. Yeah, thanks for uh, visiting us here in sunny Weewar. And yeah, interested to uh, see how your podcast uh, business goes into the future. Well done. No, thank you. It's um, it's definitely exciting. And I think, yeah, when I get to meet other people and they talk about their businesses and staff numbers and things like that, I can definitely commiserate a little bit in, in what people go through, but um, yeah, you've got no, a bit going a, on. It's a great initiative um, and a good way to communicate uh, what's happening out in agriculture across the different regions. So, yeah, well done. No, thank you. It's um, it's nice to be up here. Tell me a little bit about We War as a town. Like you've you've been here for a little while, um, since what the early nineties. Uh yeah, I started work here on the sixth of May, nineteen ninety one. So there was a lot more people back in those days, probably double, I imagine. Uh, a lot more in itinerant workers, particularly in the cotton chippers. Uh, a lot more um. People in, uh, on the farms, irrigating, cultivating, yeah, just a lot more people on farms. Uh, so I suppose that's probably been the biggest change that I've seen is the number of people, uh, in town. Uh, it's a, it's a good little community. Um, obviously communities like this, uh, what you put into it is what you get out of it. And, um, yeah, it's a great little town for, um, coming and being able to, if you're keen to work and, um, you know, make a go of stuff. There's plenty of opportunities here in Weewar with the irrigation and and uh, the diversity of the crops and and so forth. And um, I suppose that's that's a big uh, big positive about the the district. And am I right in thinking that your your family's not from a farming background? Uh, no, my father was a uh, a headmaster, um, and. Uh, he was brought up on a dairy farm. A lot of people were back in those days. Um, he's an avid uh, gardener, loved growing vegetables and had enough in the backyard for the most of the district, not just ourselves. And um, I certainly got interested in growing vegetables when I was younger through dad. Uh, and um, he broke his leg in an accident, uh, probably when he was about, when I was about 15 or 16, and it was my job to take over the, the veggie patch. So I certainly got a bit of interest in agriculture and growing stuff from that early age. Um, but yeah. What did you do to end up out here at Wee Wall? Um, so I had an uncle that I used to, uh, work for in the, in school holidays and while I was at university, uh, Reg Smith, he, um, he was a farm manager and, um, he was probably the guy that got me really interested in the broadacre agriculture. Um, I used to go wool pressing on his farm and, um, all the farms that he managed. And, um, I suppose, um, he really astounded me the knowledge that he had with the, with the education that he had. And I'm not, um, that was just the way it was back in those days. I think he told me he left school when he was in year nine with an intermediate certificate. And, um, he had a, um, uncanny ability to know a lot of stuff on about farming and operating farms. And, um, the decisions that he made really astounded me that he could do that with so little education. And, um, you know, he, he managed 20,000 sheep and 5,000 cattle with including feed lots. And then he was able to go and manage hundreds, hundred thousand acres of wheat and, um, win crop competitions. And it just fascinated me that someone could do that by just learning and thinking and just learning from other people. And that's, uh, probably what I really got me interested in agriculture. And so from that time on, was it the only pathway that you wanted to pursue? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, I did agriculture at school and I had a couple of passionate agricultural teachers, Steve Condon and Mick Holland. And, um, you know, they really tried hard to get us some good marks, so uh, that, um, you know, and, and good marks in our HSC back in those days, but also 
create some interest in at the school with ag plots and you know sheep and showing cattle and uh, visiting a few farms in the district and that so that was a bit of a passion and I suppose yeah I looked at um, maybe doing some a university course through through that passion at school. Do you remember what those earlier aspirations were when you when you started to think of what you? Uh, pretty much to be a district agronomist with the um, with the um, local the government. Yep. And um, those back in those days, there wasn't a lot of agronomy independent consultancy companies, and there was a lot of broad acre agronomists. So most of it was involved with Department of Ag. And um, when I left university in uh, 1990. There was a bit of a recession on and drought, and there wasn't many jobs available. Um, it wasn't easy to get a job. There wasn't as many agronomist jobs as what there is now. And um, I suppose through a connection with Reg, my uncle, uh, I was able to get a, a start out here at Weewell. And um, it was pretty much, didn't really know where I was going then or what I wanted to do. And I thought it would be a good way to get a bit of experience and maybe just do a year or two. But um, 33 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Having gone too far. Yeah, yeah. So look, was that an ag a district agronomy role that you'd stepped into? No, no, I didn't take a district agronomist role here, no. Um, I worked for a um, company called Nemo Rural Traders. They were an um, uh, uh, integrated company that um, supplied seed, fertiliser, chemical and also did grading and um and did some export of um some uh products like chickpeas so they had a splitting plant and um it was certainly a good start it was mainly i was we were mainly focused on legumes it was certainly a good start to get a good grasp on um you know fertilizer and chemical and um seed and varieties and and um and things like that so i worked there for four years um and, um, yeah. And I guess I'm interested because I've only ever known agronomists as being really private operators. Um, when, when did that transition happen and, and kind of what did that look like? And do you know what the reasons were for that transition? Um, I suppose there was, before my day, before I came to, um, we were, there was a lot of the chemical companies used to supply the bug checking and then, um, a few of the agronomists um, around the, that were working for those bug checking co chemical companies decided to work for you know go out on an, as an independent agronomist. So that probably was back in the in the seventies uh, when I came to town. There was half a dozen of those guys. The, Chris Lehman and Jeff Brown were probably the, the two leading agronomists back in those days, and um, they employed a range of bug checkers and so forth. That started in the 70s, but a lot of the private consulting in broadacre agriculture, away from crops, away from cotton, really didn't happen until the 90s, my recollection. And um, it certainly has grown, you know, as farmers have um, sought, you know, demanded more information and knowledge, the, um, the private consultancy um, firms have certainly um, increased in size and, and the services and information that they transfer to those farmers. And it's, yeah, it's certainly a, a big part of the farming and the agricultural production, particularly in this area, yeah. When did you make the transition into the consult, uh, into agronomy? Um, so I worked for uh, Nemo Rural Traders for four years and then um, I went and worked on a farm for a couple of years. Uh, I was asked to go and do some agronomy on the farm and um, help out on the farm. And Reg always used to say to me that um, it's no good on a piece of paper if it's not practical and doesn't work on the farm. And I always remembered that. Um, so I, I thought a bit of practical experience would be good. Learn how the farms operate. And it was an irrigation farm, so I learned how the water operated and, and just to learn how machinery and some basic, basic stuff like that. Um, so I did a couple of years there and in the first year, um, I had an opportunity to go to the Mississippi and, um, the guy I was working for encouraged me to do that. And I went and worked for a, a consultant 
over in the Mississippi, about a place called Clarksdale. And um, that was probably the biggest experience um, of, you know, my life, really. And um, I worked for a consultant over there. It was, it was a Texan, but, but um, we had a consultancy business in uh, Mississippi named Joe Townsend. And he was a, a very um, unique character, <laughs> very loud, very... Um, very Texan. Yeah, very, tex <laughs> very Texan, very Texan. And uh, I had a, a wonderful time working for him and um, learned a lot. And um, he was very helpful and he's a really good mentor and um, kept in touch with him for a long period of time after that. But I suppose that was the real passion that drove me, ha working with him and watching what he'd done and how he was able to communicate with farmers and transfer that information and, and talk to his farmers and the respect that the farmers had for him. I knew then that that's what I wanted to do. So it was just a matter of working out how to go about doing it. <laughs> so my flow on question from that. So how, well, once you got back and had, had that amazing experience, had you hit yeah, the ground so running? The, the guy that I was working for on the farm, I started doing his agronomy, um, John Palmer. Uh, and uh, he had a share farmer there as well, Darren Weber. And um, pretty much it started from there. Uh, I was to continue to work on the farm and pick up a couple of a farm next door and another farm. And I suppose those first few years wasn't, um, that certainly wasn't, uh, great financially. Um, you know, you virtually had no money sometimes to put fuel in the truck, you know, and sometimes you're looking at, I don't know, John's brother, Vinny, I, I used to get a bit of fuel off him just so that I could get to work. And, um, uh, so it certainly wasn't easy, uh, but it certainly was something that I really loved and enjoyed doing, being, uh, you know, in, able to manage the crop for the grower and try and do your best to try and get the best result for them. And um, I suppose it was a challenge, uh, but it was certainly something I wanted to do, and I, I put everything I could into it, you know, in those early days. And um, it sort of grew from there. I'm interested in this because I'd say, I feel like it's, we're similar in the sense of there's a, a, a skill set that we have, which I guess becomes our product. For me, it's the, the podcast and the interviewing side. Um, and I certainly probably haven't, haven't really put a value, a true value on what it's actually worth. Did, did you find in those early years, it wasn't about trying to earn dollars. It was about earning that experience in the stripes. Uh, correct. Correct. I, I wasn't even interested, didn't even know what to charge yeah. and it really didn't, um, worry me too much as long as I wasn't charging more than the, the other guys. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it was, certainly wasn't about the money. Um, it was about, um, trying to get to the standard that the other guys were in the industry, you know, the likes of the Jeff Browns and, and, um, and those sorts of, uh, consultants to, <laughs> To be able to manage the crop and know what you're doing, that was the focus, um, you know, and, and to do it properly, not to uh, do it half-hearted, but it, it was a lot harder to learn back in that, I shouldn't say harder, but it was not as easy with the information packages that you have now that you can get off uh, internet and Google and, and so forth. So you really had to um, know where to get resources and, and learn, learn that way um, because I was sort of, on my own, I wasn't working in underneath a, another agronomer, so that wasn't um, that wasn't overly easy. But um, I did a lot of research and thinking, and, and and a lot of after hours work to try and upskill myself in in what what needed to be done. Was there a defining moment for you? You reckon where it started to really come together and you hit your groove? I suppose when I met my wife. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it was and it was an agronomist as well. Is is an agronomist? Not was. It is still is. Uh, so when we met, um, I, I was doing some farms and Anna was doing some farms. So it was actually my uncle that introduced us out, out on a, on a, on a, a large dry land, a farm, uh, about half an hour from here. So, um, once we sort of got together and, uh, uh, started to work together and it sort of became turbocharged agronomy, you know, so. That was probably, you know, I mean, we, we, I had some clients that I was working with, uh, prior to that. And then I was working with a, um, a, a company at, uh, Maury, um, 
uh, once we sort of um, established our relationship, um, we moved in and, and started our business together. And that's probably, you know, like I say, turbocharged things. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly, I think, well, it seems like the two of you just work harder than the other. <laughs> it's uh, a, a bit on between you. It's been a long, it is a long, long, uh, a long process with cotton. It's, you know, it's seven days a week. It's, you know, it's, it's not five and six and eight, 10 hours a day. It can be 12 and, and more. So it, it, yeah, it's what you put into it is what you get out of it. You know, you can, you can do it just nine to five, but you're not, it's not going to work. If you want to be a success and, and, um, you know, have a, have a reasonable sized business that, um, can provide a future for yourself, you, it's not going to work if you're not nine to five. Would you say that those early interests that your, your uncle Reg had, had put on you like is it still there that that real passion definitely and it's not just um it's the work ethic he was always up early he did a lot of work after hours he did weekend stuff and i suppose it's 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 that and my parents had that as well and and i should say my auntie she was also a big factor in reg's um life as well she did a lot of the cooking for the shearers and she ran the books and the phone and she was magnificent organizer and, and work from daylight to dark as well. And yeah, you know, I suppose the combination of my parents and, and my auntie and my uncle, it certainly, um, yeah, it gave you a lot of work, a bit of work ethic and to know that things aren't easy. And if you're gonna, you know, achieve anything, you've got to get out and have a bit of a go. You know, you're gonna fall over a lot of times too. And it's a matter of getting back up and making sure that, you know, and that was, one thing my father always said to me is that, you know, do your best and don't quit, you know, and if you don't, if you, if you do that, you'll be a winner. And, um, I suppose I've always just taken that sort of attitude. Uh, um, but, um, there was been, you know, a, a lot of guys, just not Reg as well, but he was certainly the first, but a lot of people in agriculture that they, they love to help you, you know, and they help, love to see young people do well if they're keen and i think um if you try and learn off those older people you can really get ahead quickly and um that's what i found with uh you know a lot of the, as a guy called alan young he he actually showed me how to bug check he was a farmer and again i think he left school when he was about year eight and there wasn't anything that he couldn't do and I suppose that's a great thing about agriculture is, you know, if you've got skills and are willing to learn, there's so much you can do. And Alan, actually, he was 60 something and a farmer and he showed me how to bug check. And I, I still find that amazing that he could actually learn how to do that himself. And we, the first crop I think I checked was with him and, um, he, we decided to spray it this day and that day. And he really gave me a bit of a go and made and made uh, sure that I was thinking on the right on the right track, and um, you know that it was all about making your recommendations and making sure you were doing the right thing by the crop. So, yeah, cool. Tell me, um, we was obviously changed about. Well, I guess just with the advancements of especially cotton um, in the area here, but but for you, what what have you really noticed as as things that have evolved and changed for the better across your career? Um, certainly. Um, less spraying on the cotton, um, that's been the biggest positive. And, you know, the, the research that the cotton industry has done, the researchers that have been involved out at the, the research institute have, you know, had a big, um, impact on that. So when I think, you know, the, the cotton fields have been treated 14, 15, 16 times, you know, with insecticide when I first started, uh, managing crops. Now, you know, at this point in time, this season, we haven't treated, treated fields at all. Um, so it's, it's, that's been the biggest change in, in, um, in the cotton, um, the less insecticide that we're using. And then the other thing is, is the yields, the yields have really been, uh, able to be gained every year. And so we're nearly double what we were getting pretty much double what we're getting when I first started checking. That's 30, no, yeah, 28 years ago, I suppose. So that's, um, 
that's been a very big positive impact on, on, on cotton and the quality that the producers will be able to produce. It's a better quality product. Um, and I suppose the other major thing is that the technology with irrigation and growers just being able to manage their crops better, you know, from the word go. I think, uh, you know, they're very efficient with their water use, very efficient with their fertiliser use, and just very efficient with their resources. And you're saying the, the similarities and the carryovers between, say, the cotton and the grains? Yeah, certainly. Are... It's, it's just not cotton. I mean, we, we check on a range of crops, um, um, you know, in, in, uh, wheat and barley and uh, sorghum and uh, chickpeas and faba beans and the improvements are all through there but I think cotton has probably been the leader you know and a lot of that's to do with a lot of it's to do with the researchers but also a lot of it's to do with the agronomists and the consultants and the growers working together and managing the crops better and I think that's the cotton industry is probably just you know a very leading uh, part of agriculture in Australia but also in, in the world and um the, you know, I, don't, I think some of the work that those early consultants and early uh, growers have done about sharing information across the industry has been a, a really big advancement of how it's, you know, adapted and, and grown. So let's chat about one of the other areas you're involved in. Um, and, and so, I, well, Anna was able to educate me a little bit around biologicals because I was saying to her when I think of biologicals i've probably only started to hear about them over the last few years and i learned that what we we're putting on the faber bands before we we're sowing them was actually a biological um when they were going down the chute and i guess that's how i was thinking but but you've been really actively involved in in the insect side of things and, and introducing um yeah insects and other pieces into, into the crop can you just explain to us like yeah firstly for someone who absolutely knows nothing, like what is a biological and how are they used? Yeah, so I suppose a biological can be a range of things, whether it's a um, an insect or a a fungus or bacteria. Yeah. It's just a, a natural product, I suppose. But um, we've been, um, I suppose, the IPM integrated pest management and the the uh, the positive impact that beneficials can have on your crop has you know has been widely um, used and, and tra trans transitioned right through our industry for a long time. Um, I think it was back in about 2014, uh, we s started to get a pest here, um, called silver leaf whitefly. And, uh, they'd had issues with it in Emerald and they'd had issues at St. George. And, um, we, uh, we were told by the research they didn't think we'd have a problem here, but we ended up with a problem. And it was pretty severe in the first year. So it's a white fly that secretes a honeydew. And um, it can downgrade your cotton lint in colour and also the honeydew can be a problem with the spinning. So it can be a very big issue with cotton and um, it has been in Arizona and California, I think, for years. But they've been able to manage the pest as well. So I suppose we were doing a lot of the, to manage the pest, we were doing a lot of the, the things that our researchers were telling us to do, the, you know, the IPM road and using a soft chemical and spraying the products at a certain period. And we still found that we're having issues with the pest. And um, mainly with colour disgrades, and, which was costing growers, you know, over five or six, seven, eight hundred dollars a hectare depending on the yield, you know, and the, and the downgrade in the colour. So the thought is possibly a better way to manage this, or there must be another way to manage it. So we looked at uh, what they were doing in horticulture, with, because they get a lot of white fly and rock melon, tomatoes and, and um, other vegetable crops. And um, I just Googled one night what they were doing. And, um, yeah, the, the horticultural industry was releasing uh, little wasps in their vegetable patches, you know, all around Bowen and a, a few other places to manage this silver leaf white fly. So I rang a couple of researchers and a couple of growers that have been involved uh, with the beneficials about whether they thought it would work in cotton, and they said, yeah, it should. Give it a go. So 
uh, because we had our own little farm here, we were able to do a few trials and, um, and they were pretty positive. Anna and I spent a lot of time hand releasing at night and, um, and, um, through the crop, through the day and so forth. And we found that, yeah, that we were getting some positive results. So, um, I suppose that was in about 2016 or 17. I can't, if my memory serves me correctly, somewhere around there. And then we spoke to a couple of farmers. Um, uh, one was, um, uh, Luke and, Luke and Robin Finley and, um, their father, Bill, he was a, a cotton fanatic. And, uh, Anna and I used to work for Bill, um, years ago. And, um, he was another guy, I suppose, that really astounded me what he knew in the cotton field and the passion that he had for cotton. And, um, he often would have a sweep net looking at, looking, sweeping the cotton and looking for beneficials in the crop. And he was probably well into his sixties at that stage. And it really amazed me how much pa passion that he had for, for cotton. And he'd get me to put out the lacewing larvae on, on, um, on cards. And the next week we'd have to check to see with the lace, lace winger in the fields. And Bill told me about how he, he tried to fly beneficials on in, in his farms in America. And it always stuck in my mind about how he tried this. And, um, so I suppose we got thinking about the Hayati, we could hand release them and we get a good result. But there's no way that you could hand release tens of thousands of hectares. It's just impossible. So um, we came up with an idea about putting them in a little capsule and um, and dropping them out of a plane. And um, a few people said we're mad, and I probably thought I was too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it actually it actually worked better than than I thought it would. And um, yeah, I suppose that's what's the start of it all. How did, how did it go from being an idea around the capsule to actually being physically implemented and trialed? Yeah, it, it was a, it was a, a long, hard process. Um, we were doing, we were doing a little bit with re releasing them from drones. We found the drones cumbersome. It was too hot. You couldn't use them. It was too windy. You couldn't use them. It was rain. You couldn't use them. So there was another consultant as well that was interested in using them, um, Mike Stone, Maury, and I mentioned to him about the idea of dropping them out of a capsule and he thought it was a great idea. And um, I suppose he's, he's thinking that Mike's a leading consultant in the industry and um, I suppose once he sort of thought it was a good idea, it gave me the confidence to give it a bit of a go. And, um, I was telling a mate that I went to university with about the idea of it and, um, he was sort of finishing up in Melbourne. Um, and he liked the idea. He did a, did a bit of research and he, he decided to sort of come and help me with the project. And, um, I suppose he had a bit of some background, no real background knowledge in agriculture, but background knowledge in food and food technology and that was certainly beneficial in in getting it going he had some contacts that could injection mold the product and um pretty much from there um yeah it was a slow process but we we got it going um i got a a local guy here um david johnson from crockwell to build build a hopper that we could put the capsules in the plane and he um he developed it so that we could release so many per hectare and have a, have a good rate. There was a, you know, a, a, a distribution was even across the field mm -hmm. and, um, a little bit of, um, few changes along the way with his product, but it, it ended up working pretty well. And, um, yeah, I suppose that's been the story of, yeah. So I think, well, I was going to say what, what the capsule reminds me of is nearly what's inside those kinder surprises about the same size. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few other goodies yeah, come out of it. Yeah. You're not the first person that's <laughs> said that. So yeah. And then in my head, I was thinking that it was literally a pilot just dropping it out the window, but it is very, it has to be really quite precise. Yeah. It's, it's precise so that we can get a good, even distribution. Um, 
the hoppers are CASA approved, so that um, you know the, they're they're allowed to be put in planes. Yeah, and um, we're able to get them out very quickly. So then the wasps going to merge. That's the the key to it. Is is they've got to survive. So they're, they're released as a larvae. They've got to survive, and they've got to find a mate. So the males usually emerge first. They mate with the females, and the females go off and lay eggs mm -hmm. in the white fly larvae, and then they reproduce in, in in a couple of weeks or more, and then go and take out more white fly. So um, the capsule has been able to increase the the survival of the wasps and that mating process. Yeah. What do you reckon the opportunity is with with the the capsules themselves, but uh, across I'll say broad acre agriculture, what is the opportunity with being able to introduce biologicals like this? It's certainly because you can do big areas very quickly and it can be, you know, it's not a, I wouldn't call it, it's not a, you're not putting out bushfires, we're inoculating the crops so that we, as soon as we start seeing the pests, we release the beneficials and then they sort of stop the, the pests from getting out of control or becoming a problem. So we're releasing them very early. Um... We've been doing some work in corn with trigger grammar. We've been doing work in canola for aphids with aphid wasps. Um, we've done some uh, release in pecan orchards this year with trigger grammar. So I think there's um, it's certainly a big opportunity for a range of um, applications. Um, it's just not easy to get hold of the the good bugs. That's the 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 big difficult. Um, uh, thing because they're not reared in massive numbers. It's required in broad acre. So I think um, you know the the um, when we started to do the Hayati, the insectaries may have been rearing you know hundreds of thousands of the the, the wasps each year. Now they're up to thirty to forty to fifty million of them. Wow. So it's not easy to do that either. And you, uh, so that's probably the hardest part is to get hold of the, the good bugs um, and then have the growers scheduled to use them at the right time. Yeah. How'd the trials in canola go? Um, variable. So we had some um, good results on some fields and some farms um, and not so good on other farms. Um, so we've been doing that for a couple of years now. Uh, we're involved with a GRDC project next year mm -hmm. um, with uh, Caesar, and hopefully trying to um, look at um, release rates or release timings and and specific species of aphids or specific species of the of the wasps for those specific aphids to see if we can get some improvement. So um, the results weren't. Um, Conclusive, but we had did have some positive positive farms that that, uh, uh, that worked okay. Yeah. So watch this space. Watch this space. Hopefully, we'll learn some more more with the GRDC project that's happening over the next few years. And um, uh, yeah, fantastic. And I guess a, a couple of questions to to round it out. But um, for you, what do you see as the next, I guess, frontier of opportunity? in broadacre ag and what you're saying? Well, I think it's probably going to be um, dominated by the consumer, you know, um, what the, the products that, they, that they're going to demand, you know, uh, less pesticide, uh, more carbon friendly. And I think that, yeah, the producers have got to align with that. It uh, may well happen a lot quicker than we think. Um, I suppose bigger corporate farms will be able to meet those demands a little bit easier. I think if, you know, the the family farm, if they want to be able to be in that space, they've really got to, you know, either piggyback on, on someone else or, or get on the front foot. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not that we don't produce good products now, but it's going to always be done better. It will be done better. The way that we're doing it now certainly won't be doing that in, in 20 and 30 years. It'll be totally different.
be very different. So and I think that's uh, what my wife and I have always tried to do with our agronomy business is to try and be on the front foot with that changing um, scenario that happens in agriculture cause, and it's happening quicker and quicker. And, you know, as an agronomist or as a business, you really got to embrace the change because if you don't, if you keep doing it like you are, it's not going to, it's not going to, um, it's not going to be the way, it's not going to be that way in the future. So you just got to keep trying to change, try things and, um, and get, and try and get better and improve. How have you found, like with the, I'll say the increase in information going from back in the day when it was of an evening, you'd read whatever publications were coming out to now it's, it's there all the time. How do you, how do you go sifting through what's good, useful? It, certainly, yeah, I suppose you've got to find what's useful and what's not useful. Um, I suppose I've had links with other consultants in other areas and that's been a big, um, big help talking on the phone with experienced guys. Uh, um, probably one of the leading best agronomists, very technical. I call him King Consultant, you know, J Jamie Street from St. George. I was very fortunate to develop a relationship with him and he, he knew a lot of, and did a lot of research and he'd be able to, so you, yeah, talking to those types of people, you could really cut out what you needed, what was good and what was bad. They're in the same game as you. And, um, so that, that's certainly a big help. Um, but I suppose, yeah, it's just a matter of research is good, but it's not all like my uncle used to always say, if it doesn't, it might work on paper, but if it doesn't work in the paddock, it's not, you know, not too good, not going to be too much good for the farmer. So it's just a matter of that and experience and asking, asking other farmers as well. Like farmers have been growing these crops for 30 and 40 years. And a lot of the guys that I work for, I learn off every day, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, but I've learned so much off all the growers that I work for and, um, listening to how they, how they produce their crops and their thoughts because they're doing the research as well. So you can learn so much from your farmers and you're able to trans or communicate that to other farmers. And that's probably what agronomy is really. But I think, you know, learning from, you got to learn to know who to learn from and that probably takes experience too. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Steve, thank you so much for having us and for sitting down for a chat. It's been fantastic. Yeah, it's great, Ollie. And once again, thanks for coming all the way to Weewool from Geelong. And um, yeah, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And we'll keep our eyes peeled for how this GRDC trial goes next year. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it, actually. Thanks. Thank you.